we have Cristina Sanchez, one of the most important cannabis researchers in the world. She is in molecular biology in the Complutense University of Madrid, and she's going to talk about cannabinoids as anti-tumoral therapy. So, Dr. Sanchez, you have the floor. So, in this half hour, I'm going to try to summarize briefly about the clinical evidence that suggests that cannabinoids can be used for the treatment of cancer. As you know, cancer is a pathology that is uncontrolled growth of mutated cells. And this is usually accompanied by the generation of new blood vessels that will irrigate these growing tumor masses, providing them with nutrients, eliminating waste, and in uh, the more lethal or advanced stages of the disease, we see what is called metastasis, which is colonization of new niches in the body, forming new tumor masses. And in addition to this, patients have to deal with pain associated to the disease and side effects of the anti-tumor therapies they receive. Among them, we have mentioned, mentioned a loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, of course, pain toxicity in important organs. And for years, we've known that cannabinoids can benefit cancer patients as palliative agents. In many countries, for example, they can be prescribed to treat cancer pain or symptoms associated to anti-tumor therapy. But what our group has been doing for over 15 years trying to show that in addition to the palliative effects, cannabinoids can have anti tumor effects. In other words, they could fight tumors. Well, when you want to show that you have an anti-tumor tool, you have to show two things, and just two things. First, that it works, that it kills tumor cells and prevents the progression I showed you before. And secondly, they have to be safe. Very simple but at the same time very complicated. And what I want to tell you is to convince you that we have preclinical evidence that is quite solid showing that cannabinoids do meet these two requisites. Entonces, primero, do cannabinoids work as anti-tumor agents? Well, let's go for a bit of history and then let me tell you how our group started with this type of studies. And from the end of the 1990s, we were working in the analysis of cannabinoid effect on the metabolism of brain cells, analyzing if when these cells are exposed to cannabinoids, they consume more or less glucose and lipids, etc. And we were using cells that were not neurons, but we're talking about the accompanying cells called the astrocytes. So we would grow them in petri dishes, expose them to cannabinoids, and do this metabolic analysis I was talking about. But working with astrocytes is very complicated, very expensive, very cumbersome and laborious, and it took weeks for certain experiments. So we needed a cheaper cell model and a more or a less complicated model. So basically, we were looking at tumor cells because they do have the advantage of growing beyond controlled. And we, you can buy cells like astrocytes. So it would be the tumor equivalent of an astrocyte. And we started working with that. Well, we tried to do our metabolic experiments, but we couldn't do a single one because when we exposed the tumor cell to a cannabinoid, the cell died. And this time, I uh, was starting my PhD thesis 
and it was in a crisis and it was like okay they're going to kick me out of the laboratory i cannot do a single experiment but after after a little mental block we realized that we had something that was killing tumor cells so we left aside all our metabolic studies and started focusing on this potential anti-tumor activity so the first thing we did was to confirm that it was indeed the case and effectively what we observed one time and again time and time again is that our tumor astrocytes when exposed to THC the cells died and that is the aspect of a tumor cell culture in a petri dish and that's the aspect after being exposed to THC so you see that the cells are unclumped and dead and we see here that in cell lines and others we see that this effect would not happen in the astrocyte itself the healthy cell they did not respond to cannabinoids in this way they would not die when exposed to cannabinoids as tumor cells did so when we realized that there was the answer in cell culture we went a step ahead and started analyzing this potential anti-tumor effect in different animal models for cancer on the left you have the simplest one where you inoculate tumor cells human tumor cells in the back of immunodeficient mice so you have brain tumor cells that you inject into the back of a mice that has been bred to have no immune ability so here you have the effect of an animal receiving THC and not receiving THC you see that the tumors of the group receiving THC are much smaller and that are not as red so we are blocking not only the growth of the tumor but the other process that it would is and the genesis of blood vessels for irrigation and elimination purposes but you see that this model on the left has limited physiological relevance we are generating a brain tumor in the back of a mouse so we wanted for a more physiological model so we generated brain tumors in the brain of rats to the left we have an MRI of a rat before receiving THC treatment and you see this white mass there that's a brain tumor to the right you have the same rat after THC treatment and you see that the tumor is gone and this white spot is the scar of the injection of THC into the tumor but the tumor itself has completely disappeared after many years of work we know very well what happens inside the tumor cell that makes it disappear we know that cannabinoids activate specific receptors as we've said before CB1 and CB2 activate a cascade of events within the tumor cell and I'm not going to bore you with the details and what I want you to have uh, clear is that all this information results in the inhibition of this protein which is the key regulator of cell survival whether it, it decides whether it is alive or not we have shown that when cannabinoid receptors activate this regulator protein is inhibited so this activates what is called apoptosis or the suicide of the tumor cell so apoptosis is the scientific yeah way to call cell suicide so this slide summarizes 10 years of work coordinated uh, mainly by my colleague Guillermo Velasquez so that's for brain tumors for a few years however we've opened a second line of research which is breast cancer particularly 
a type of breast cancers that have high levels of these proteins called ER2. Currently, these patients are treated with a specific antibody, anti-ER2, which is called trastuzumab. And even trastuzumab has improved the prognosis of these patients. There are still some patients who do not respond or who initially respond, but then acquire resistance to the drug. So we wanted to continue with this because the treatment for these patients is not finished then. And we want to know whether cannabinoids could be useful. So in these experiments, we used a very interesting animal model, which is MMTUV new mice, which are genetically bred to express this no protein, which is a rat equivalent to ear 2 as a consequence of this genetic manipulation, these mice spontaneously, spontaneously generate breast tumors. We don't have to inject it into them. And they do it with a very, very long latency period, which mimics the human pathology because we don't have rapidly appearing tumors here in our patients. Another characteristic of this model is that about 80% of the female mice generate metastasis to the lung. So because of this characteristics, this model is considered in the clinical community as a very good breast tumor model for or positive for ER2 metastatic, ER2 positive is called. So we treated these uh, patients or mice for, with THC for three months. And this is the behavior of the mice or the female mice to which THC was not administrated. And we see the size of the tumors over time. And you can see that the tumor growth is even exponential. But when they were treated with THC, this growth is significantly decreased. And not only that, we also observed that TC reduced the generation of tumors. I don't know whether you know it, but uh, female mice has 10 nipples or 10 breasts, if you will. So we found uh, animals with multiple tumors. And in the population that does not receive TC, we observed a 40% of individuals with four or more tumors. If you compare that with the THC treated population, we did not find any with those characteristics. And 50% only had a single tumor. So we're reducing not only size, but number of tumors. THC also decreased the percentage of animals developing lung metastasis which is represented here in this bar. But these data come from an animal model. So the next question is, will a human breast tumor cell, would, would it be susceptible to cannabinoid treatment as well? So we started culturing cells with ear two positive cells, human breast cells, that were cultured, exposed to THC then, you can see the green bars. As the THC concentration increases, their viability is decreased. In other words, we kill them with THC. We can reproduce this behavior in vivo in animal models. In this case, we went back to the tumor generation model, in other words, injecting tumor cells in the backs of immunodeficient uh, mice and then treated the individuals with THC. It was oral administration. We wanted to basically simulate as close as possible what the route would be for human beings, administration route. And here, in what you have the behavior of the population does not 
receive THC and you see that the ones that do receive it have decreased tumor growth. We also analyzed whether in the case of glioblastomas or brain tumors, the mechanism went through the apoptosis or cell suicide of the tumor. And it was the case. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. In this case, we are marking or dyeing the cells that are proliferating within the tumor. And we can mark them with a pink dye. I don't know whether you see it. But in this photograph to the left, you have a lot of pink little dots, an animal that has not received TC. And to the right, we have a lot fewer uh, dots. Um, in other words, that tumor of the animal that received THC went down in size. And this is also inducing apoptosis or the suicide of tumor cells. And I don't see whether you can see it because I don't either, but in this photograph for the animal treated with THC, we have a lot more pink dots compared to the animal that did not receive it. And right now, we are marking then, or dying, the cells committing suicide. And THC treatment also reduced the number of blood vessels irrigating the tumor. Again, we are seeing that angiogenesis is being blocked by THC. In other words, the formation of new blood vessels. And as you can see, We've seen about 1% of all the results that we have so far, not only from our group, but many other research groups that are working on THC, especially as an antitumoral agent. I hope I convince you that there is potential. And even the models in, on which we can work show that cannabinoids have an enormous potential as antitumor agents. Now, the second question is, whether they are safe and they are i'm not going to show you too much data but we already know that that this response of cell suicide is not induced in non-tumor cells in other words in healthy cells you work with an astrocyte and expose it to hc the astrocyte will not die but an astrocytoma or the tumor equivalent will We've shown it all other types of tumors we have worked with. And we have additional evidence that show or suggest that cannabinoids are safe compounds. The first one that I want to show you is that at least in breast cancer, anti-tumor effect is due to activation of the CB2 receptor. Remember from the presentation that we have CB1 and CB2. They're responsible for the psychotropic effects of marijuana is CB1, which is abundantly expressed in the central nervous system, but it does not have CB2, and it, or it's very, very low. So the psychoactive effect of marijuana is due to the activation of CB1. And you see that the most of the beneficial effects here are due to the activation of the non-psychotropic receptor. So you see that the anti-tumor effect that we observe in the spontaneous breast cancer model shows that the THC effect is produced as JWLH, which is a synthetic cannabinoid, which only targets CB2 as a receptor. So in other words, we can reproduce THC's effect by activating CB2. And in this other graphic, what we've seen is, or we've done really, is to block CB2, not allowing, not allowing that THC activate CB2. So it's an antagonist, basically. We treat animals with THC. And one of these lines, we have the animals that do not receive it and when we treat with THC we have an tumor effect and when we block CB2 with this SRO2 we lose the anti-tumor effect. In other words, CB2 needs to be activated to have an anti-tumor effect. 
showing again that the activation of the non-psychotropic receptor produces the anti-tumor effect. So now the, the question is, do we have CB2 in patient tumors? Because this data came from animals. Well, what we've done recently to answer this question is to analyze the expression of this receptor in over 700 patient samples. This is a rather complicated uh, chart. Don't waste your time. Just look at this. But here, two positive patients. And this uh, sample collection was to analyze the expression of CB2 and uh, give it a classification or category. Zero would be no receptor. Three, if you had very high expression of CB2 and intermediate, you would have one or two with a bit or a bit more of CB2 expression. And we started analyzing our almost 800 samples and showed that your two positive patients only 3% of them did not have any of these receptors. In other words, 97% of the patients, basically everybody, have at least some CB2 receptors. So if we're talking about cannabinoid-based therapies, these uh, patients would have the target on which we are acting. Another argument to defend that cannabinoids or cannabinoid therapies can be effective and safe in treatment of cancer, in this case breast cancer, is that CBT, the cannabinoid, as we said, is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid produced by marijuana, produces exactly the same anti-tumor effect as THC, at least in our models for HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. The white and green bars you've seen before already, and in this case, let's look at the yellow ones, which correspond to CBD. Just as THC, they are reducing, based on dosage, uh, the feasibility of tumor cells. And they do this not just in vitro, in cell cultures, but also in mo animal models. This is the behavior, if you remember, of the animals that did not receive cannabinoids. This line is growth in tumors on animals that are treated with THC. And this is the behavior of tumors for those that are receiving treatment with CBD. These are the preclinical data we have that say that cannabinoids are safe. But there's many data that say that they are safe in humans. These data come from several clinical trials that have already been performed throughout the world, not just on oncological patients, but also those that have pain, anxiety, and different pathologies. One day before I came, I uh, searched to find how many clinical trials have been performed to date with three cannabinoid medications, Sativex, Marinol, and CBD. And for Sativex, there's 318 trials that have been completed. And all these show that cannabinoids are safe. Sativex is safe. There's 86 trials, completed trials with Marinol. Each and every one of them says that Marinol is a safe complex for compound for uh, patients, and there's 39 on CBD, and those all say the same as well. This means that cannabinoids are safe compounds for patients. So we have compounds that work as antitumoral drugs, and they are also safe. What should we do now? What comes next is finding out if they actually work on humans for anti-tumoral agent effects. For this, the only option we have is to test them on humans. Our group participated in a, in a pilot trial that was done in 2006. It was the first in the world where oncological patients received a treatment with THC. Not to see if it uh, helped with the side effects of chemotherapy, but actually to see if it had anti-tumor effects. 
This trial was done in 2006 in Spain. It was a pilot test because we could just have a very small number of patients, specifically nine, and patients that had a very advanced stage of the disease, disease with recurrent multiform myoblastomas, and that had been already um, dismissed for the rest of the treatment. And so we worked with patients that had been uh, diagnosed with GBM that had already gone through a first surgery to eliminate the tumor, along with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And months later, the patients had recurrence. When starting to come to the second uh, surgery to remove the recurrent uh, tumor, they had in the exact place where the tumor had been taken out of a catheter dispensing THC directly in the brain. And we followed these patients until their death. What we observed, and before telling you the results, I would like to insist that the population under study was very small, so the conclusions can be just limited. But of course, they uh, show us the direction that could be very interesting. First of all, THC, I insist, it was directly inject injected into the brain. It did not lead to any psychotropic effects. Secondly, we saw that it reduced tumor growth in some of the patients. THC also increased the life of some of the patients. And these two things reduced tumor size and m more life or in increase in life were done by THC just as well or as bad as thermoformide, which is the medication that these patients currently receive. So THC was just as effective or as ineffective uh, as the only medication that they can receive right now. And something that for us is very important is that we observed that THC activated the same molecular mechanisms that in our animal models. This validates the potentiality and the relevance of preclinical models that we are using in the lab. If we look at the colored spots, what you have to the right in each of these panels is a sample of a tumor of a patient after receiving THC treatment. And I could say you could see, but I'm not sure. You have to believe me. I'm not sure if you can actually see it. But in this case, we saw less cells proliferating in patients that were treated with THC, less blood vessels irrigating tumors, and many more cells with apoptosis. This uh, trial was done in 2006, as I said, and in these almost 10 years, as has been mentioned previously, there has been a stop uh, or a block to this. We don't know why. We intuit, but they're not politically correct, so I cannot go into them. But thankfully, in 2014, we had a trial, a study uh, that began in the UK, and it will analyze the effect of a combination of Sativex with uh, thermosolidamide, which is the standard uh, treatment for GBM patients. The uh, screening for these patients uh, has already started. They have to have multiform geoblastoma, and we hope to have results by the end of this year or during 2016. A bit later after that, there was a clinical study uh, that started in Israel that will treat patients with solid tumors with not, without differentiating the type of tumors, tumors, in this case with CBD. It won't be combined with any other medications. It will be applied as a single agent. In principle, they will start recruiting patients in November last year, but uh, as far as I know, it hasn't started. So these results will take a bit longer. But the good news is that at least we have two studies underway, and in the coming months, possibly one or two more. To conclude, we firmly believe that we have solid evidence to say that cannabinoids could be a new therapeutic tool to treat cancer because they work as anti-tumor agents, at least in the preclinical models, and because they are safe. 
also we have mentioned that cannabinoids have additional advantages that benefit oncological patients. These are analgesic compounds, they stimulate appetite, they are antihemetics, etc. So what can we do on our part to continue promoting and what will we do uh, pr to promote the fact that uh, cannabinoids have to come to clinical parts for the uh, patients with uh, cancer? We are still doing our uh, research, that's what we do, that's our part, and we're still seeing now whether cannabinoids combine well with standard uh, treatment that, receive, that patients receive currently. We also want to know more about the mechanism of action in biochemistry. Like in life, information is power. The more you know and the more information you have on the action mechanism of cannabinoids, the best and the most refined manner will you find to fight the tumor cell. We are also aware that to know these work on humans, we need more trials on humans. And for that, we do a lot of informing and uh, telling things to anyone that wants to listen to us. Of course, it's not just the scientific community. They're already convinced. Now we have to go to the clinical community. These compounds have to reach patients as soon as possible. We know they're already using them, but they're using them in the best in the way that might not be the best way. So we want to convince the medical community that patients have to benefit from these treatments and as soon as possible. To end, I'd like to show you all the people that are involved. There's many more that have gone through our lab in all these years. This is just a, sl a small representation of the people that participate in our studies for uh, glioblastomas and uh, breast cancer tumors. And I'd like to especially thank those that work on breast cancer, because I coordinate this area, and you can see them here in the picture. Very especially Eduardo Perez Gomez, who is a postdoctorate fellow that uh, basically is in charge of the lab, Clara Andrada, Sandra Vasco Benito, Rodrigo Fernando, and Manuel Guzman, that I'm sure mon many of you know.